If you look at the performance of the telecom sector in 2019 and 20, it underperformed the S&P TSX by 700 basis points and 800 basis points. Now you're seeing that starting to change. Hi, it's Greg Gornert, Vice President, Senior Investment Advisor, Canical Genuity Wealth Management and Gornert Wealth Management. Now, welcome to the channel where we help you make sense of the financial world. Now, as usual, if you like my videos, like my content, feel free to share, subscribe, hit that notification bell. That'd be great. There's been a lot going on in the Canadian telecommunications and media sector. So today, I'm going to be joined by our analyst on that sector, Aravinder Galpati Gay. Talk a little bit about uh, your sector right now. A lot of things are happening in it. In particular, we've got the Rogers and the Shaw transaction going on. Yeah, so obviously uh, that was announced uh, a couple of months ago. It wasn't entirely a surprise. Um, it was speculated for a while, certainly the better part of two or three years. And um, we don't expect this to close this year. Uh, there are three um, regulatory bodies that need to approve it. I said the CRTC and the Competition Bureau. So I think those approvals would flow through perhaps the remainder of the year going into next year. So um, I think that will take a while, but uh, the, um, you know, certainly the bet that I'm making, and I think it's not uh, too differentiated, is that uh, the deal would go through. Um, it would go through the way we say it, with remedies, which means that it won't go through in the current form. Um, the simplest way to explain this is to say that it, uh, the regulators will likely ask uh, Rogers to spin out or divest Shaw Wireless and just combine the cable assets, which the Rogers would be fine with. Um, then obviously there's a question of who would buy that. That's a six, potentially six billion dollar asset. Could it be Quebec or could it be private equity? Could could there be a new company that comes in? So all those questions will be uh, asked and potentially answered down the road. But that's the timeline. But if you're asking, you know, but in terms of the probability of the transaction in whatever form going through, it's very high. It's, it's up in the 80s. And I think you're starting to see the short share price tick up slowly, but tick up towards that offer price. I heard you make a comment that you're starting to see the competitive environment uh, in, in the space kind of moderate a little bit, you know, as opposed to where we were a couple of years ago. Yes. Um, competitive intensity in wireless has been high for a period of time. I mean, we saw elevated levels of competitive intensity and promotional activity during the holiday season of 2019. And then as we came out of that initial wave uh, of COVID-19, uh, we saw excessive promotional activity uh, all the way through to um, the back to school season, so call it August, September, 2020. And that put a lot of pressure on the financial performance of the, the wireless entities. Since then, uh, we have seen a moderation in that competitive activity, which is a good thing for the telecoms. This transaction uh, potentially assists that because historically, uh, a lot of the promotional um, intensity has been ignited by Freedom and Shaw Wireless. They make the first move, Rogers reacts, and then right. Bell and Telus react on, it, on their own. So as Shaw thinks about selling to Rogers, or being sold, or having wireless sold to somebody else, they're, we're already seeing them step back. So the you know so that trigger is gone. So this period of of calmer promotional activity can extend you know at least for another year because there's no reason for them to step up uh, that intensity while this process is going on. So at, it's gonna, it'll likely remain this way at least for a year, and then after that, we'll see who buys the asset and so on. But even if a, a new company buys that uh, entity, it's not like they're going to start off, uh, you know, firing out uh, huge promotions. That's not the way to do it. So at least on that front, we are, you know, the the, the sector, uh, you know, has a good outlook. We don't see the kind of uh, elevated intensity that we saw in nineteen and. Uh, most of 20. You had been talking about the TPA decision uh, and uh, some CRTC rulings that uh, uh, just the, the lay of the land in, in the telecoms in the wireless space over the past little bit, you, you've said that it's it's moderated quite a bit. Yeah, so that's 
So that we talked about the promotional component. The other component is regulatory, and that's what TPIA speaks to. If you go back to 2019 and 20, the regulatory picture for telecom was challenging. You know, you had uh, the CRTC initiating the idea of MVNO, uh, uh, which is sort of uh, the idea of virtual mobile networks, um, essentially introducing a reseller model into wireless, into the wireless industry. And that has always been what the industry feared the most. So the fact that that kind of hung over the industry since 2019 has been a, has been a negative. Then you had uh, the government stepping up its campaign to push down wireless pricing. They put it on, you know, the Liberal government, uh, the Liberal Party put it on their election manifesto, made a promise that they're going to cut prices by 25%. When they came into power, they, uh, or when they returned to power, they uh, essentially um, uh, rolled out a quasi-mandate to, to the incumbents to cut prices by 25%. So all of that was negative for the industry. That has been starting to change, uh, particularly as we think about the latter half of the pandemic, because I think the government and the regulator realized how significant uh, the telecom industry is, how important facilities-based telecom is. And um, the Canadian system generally held up well uh, as the traffic uh, patterns changed obviously during the pandemic with most of us working from home. So that created a better relationship between the industry and uh, and the government and that is was starting to be reflected in their regulatory decisions. The MVNO decision came in somewhat in the middle, nowhere near what some of us or maybe uh, some uh, industry experts would have feared. It was more, I won't call it benign, but it was very manageable for the incumbents. Right. And right. then you had the TPIA decision, which, you know, many uh, industry observers would see as quite positive for Bell, Bell Rogers, Teller Shaw, for the incumbents. Um, so that, you know, the, the, that, uh, you know, that the sort of the, 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 the regulatory outlook has clearly changed from being one of one that was very negative it's one that's actually quite quite manageable and uh, it's a big part of investing in telecom um, if you look at the performance of the telecom sector in 2019 and 20 it underperformed the S&P TSX by 700 basis points and 800 basis points now you're seeing that starting to change you had a note talking about um, Google delaying um, their uh, mandate to eliminate or, or uh, regulate cookies, in, uh, and, and how does that affect some of the companies that, that you follow in, uh, in that sector as a whole? Yes, yeah, so we cover a number of uh, digital media uh, businesses, Acuity Ads, BBTV, EQ Inc. Um, but the company that it affects the most is Acuity Ads and then also EQ Inc. Acuity is the larger company that uh, you know recently listed in the NASDAQ as well. Uh, it's about a 750 million dollar entity um, and, a, and a, one of our one of our sort of highlighted buys um, the risk to advertising technology is that if the cookie the third party cookie was retired it would have to be replaced by another tracker and the tracker that was to be used is what's known as the unified ID I mean there are a number of options being right. developed by various parties but this was the lead alternative and while the idea of unified ID was getting stronger, more and more people were signing on, it was being perfected, there are a lot of people in the industry who feel that it wasn't 100% ready. And the clock was ticking towards early 2022, which was when mm -hmm. Google yeah. had said that they would retire the third party cookie from Chrome. Um, if that had happened, while I don't think the industry would have you know, changed dramatically, permanently, there could have been some transitional problems, you know, because the third party cookie allows websites to track who their users are, not just the one, not just with respect to their traffic within their website, but what other websites or what other platforms have you been on? It helps you create a profile of who you are so that ads can be served that are more suited to you mm -hmm. and thereby uh, generating higher return on investment for the advertisers on your platform. So that whole system could have got disturbed if the third party cookie was retired without a good alternative. And, you know, 
it was just a big question mark. We didn't know how it was going to play out. Everybody, you know, there were many opinions on it, but investors don't like that kind of uncertainty. No. Now with this getting pushed out into late 2023, there's yeah. more than enough time for the unified ID and whatever whatever other alternatives are out there to um, to uh, to to develop itself into a, a, a robust alternative. You know, we're coming into Jul- July 1st, Canada Day, tomorrow. Um, media, in particular, Cineplex, movies. This used to be in a different time when we used to be more regular people. This would be the time we go for air conditioning inside and watch a blockbuster movie. That's not coming back anytime soon, but uh, theater's opening and you cover uh, Cineplex. So uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Obviously, well, I would think it's a little bit different than, uh, you know, uh, AMC in the States, but, um, you know, similarly troubled industry that's uh, seen a bit of a rebound. What are your thoughts there? Look, I mean, Cineplex as a stock, has already rebounded off the lows. And it was driven by the fact that there was so much activity around AMC Entertainment, um, and there was a fairly active um, sort of a post-pandemic trade that was playing out in the market and Cineplex benefited from it. Uh, in my view, it, the stock is well ahead of our target, so it, it's, it's more than, in my view at least, it's getting sort of more than its fair uh, valuation given where conditions are right now. Yeah, because I, I got to um, think that that whole sector has changed right now. We've seen streaming services go up, Disney Plus, HBO Max, if I'm getting it right. Uh, and there's a lot of movies in the pipeline that uh, I know if you're a, mo- you know, a movie studio, you've been, uh, you've been carrying these things, you know, the, the big titles for a while. The, the James Bond one is out there. They had to go Wonder Woman 84 had to go out by streaming. And I can't imagine that's ideal. Right. Yeah, so that is, I mean, the film slate is good because everything was held back. Now you're going to get right. a really rich film slate. So there will be periods of strength in the box office. But uh, what I worry about is that this period of time where where the studios were, you know, essentially placing these uh, blockbuster titles within their SWAT platform. So on Disney Plus or HBO Max or whatever your platform is. And that became a model that mm. compromises the theatrical window. Yeah. Right? Because it's back in the day, all you had to consider, what Disney had to think about is, would I make more money if I put Marvel Avengers, you know, in the theater and then bring the DVD or the, the VOD release up 30 days as opposed to 90 days? Like what, which alternative makes more money for me? Now it's the central component of each media company's investment thesis is how well is my SWOT platform doing? My mm-hmm. Netflix lookalike? How well yeah. is Disney yeah. Plus doing? How well is Discovery Plus doing? How well is HBO Max doing? Uh, so it doesn't matter to them if the alternative of putting it on their SWOT platform makes a little less money, it drives greater value because that's what investors are looking for. That is the central part of their long-term strategy. So that that you know the the pandemic allowed uh, the industry to try that out and um i don't know if they go back to having a 90-day gap again yeah that's, and, that's a good point yeah because i i think that i mean a lot of things have changed with the pandemic some things will go back to normal but some things aren't, aren't going to go back the same way again and there, and there are some advantages to that recurring revenue yeah. model i would think on on a on a you know Disney Plus or a HBO Max or you know Netflix as you said lookalikes. Why don't we wrap it up there? I uh, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to join us. You know, please come back again. Of course. Arvinda, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching the video. If you want to see more content like that, please consider subscribing or visit my website at www.greggorner.com. That's www.greggorner.com. Look forward to seeing you there. Bye.